In the words of the philosopher C.A. Moss, dodge this. Move over, Double Dragon. Finally, there's a true sequel to Renegade. You remember Renegade, of course. A revolutionary arcade hit, it more or less created the walk-and-punch brawler genre from whole cloth. There had been scrolling brawlers before Renegade, of course, but the likes of Kung Fu and Dragon Wong worked differently, more simplistically. They played out in only two dimensions, with protagonists who could only walk left or right and occasionally jump or climb stairs as needed. Renegade pitched things into, well, not quite an isometric perspective, but into a sort of forced top-down 3D. The player character, Mr. K, could walk left or right and occasionally jump, but he could also move into and out of the screen on a lateral axis. This opened up an entire world of strategic possibilities for the game's brawling action. Rather than simply punch bad guys one at a time as they marched and leapt toward the hero, Mr. K could maneuver around them, dodging attacks by ducking to the side and approaching a rival from above or below to move within attack range while avoiding the enemy's punches and kicks, since Renegade fixed all attacks to the left-right axis. But this also made it easy for foes to surround and gain the advantage against a careless player. Mr. K had to stay on his toes in order to avoid being mobbed in all directions, making for a challenging game with an appeal entirely unique from the belt scrollers that had come before it. Eager to build on the success of the game, developer Technos Japan quickly created a follow-up that introduced a second player to the mix, Double Dragon. While clearly descended from Renegade, Double Dragon had nothing to do narratively with that game and introduced its own distinct mechanics, establishing a new franchise unto itself. But Renegade creator Yoshihisa Kishimoto couldn't let his invention fade quite so easily. Kishimoto had put a lot of himself into Renegade, you see. In Japan, of course, Renegade shipped under the name Neketsu Koha Kunio-kun, and it didn't involve random street thugs the way the Western adaptation had. Instead, it revolved around teen delinquents, Yankees and Sukeban, all clad in Japanese school uniforms and getting into dust-ups around River City, aka Tokyo. All of this came from Kishimoto's own past. The time he spent rumbling and brawling as a teenager in the 1970s influenced the theme of Renegade, or rather of Neketsu Koha Kunio-kun, enhanced, of course, with a bit of his love for the era's kung fu and gang films, like Enter the Dragon and The Warriors. So Kishimoto lobbied for a continuation of Renegade at Technos, a boon that the powers that be eventually granted him. And so it came to pass that in June of 1989, a plucky little upstart called Sony ImageSoft brought this sequel to NES, an adaptation of the arcade game by the same title. But this was not a brawler called Renegade 2 or Kunio Kun Fights Again or anything that you might logically expect from a follow-up to the earlier game. I suppose Technos had already created a brawl-based successor to Renegade in Double Dragon, so instead they swerved wildly and created a dodgeball game? Ladies and gentlemen, prepare to witness the greatest happening in sport. Sudden Death Dodgeball. Yes, Super Dodgeball is the first true sequel to Renegade, a fact that would have been perfectly clear to Japanese players due to the implication of a series or sequel in the game's title for that region. It doesn't actually mention Kunio-kun by name, but Neketsu Koko Dodgeball Bu, the hot-blooded high school dodgeball club, clearly belonged to the same universe as the Japanese release of Renegade. The character sprites looked like better-defined and more comical versions of the schoolboys in Japan's Renegade, and Kunio himself served as team captain here, appearing on the title screen in his iconic white uniform before doffing it in favor of a gym outfit. Although the move from brawler to sports game seems like a bizarre swerve into left field at first glance, it kind of makes sense. After all, Kunio-kun was a high school student, despite his ruffian nature, and it stands to reason that he wasn't cutting class all the time. And it follows that if he were obligated to participate in after-sports activities in order to maintain a passing grade, Kunio would have gravitated toward sports, especially a sport that involves maximum violence, like dodgeball. Now, according to the internet, dodgeball as a sport dates back hundreds of years. A quick Google search brings up a ton of results talking about how the game originated in Africa a few centuries ago, but in a more violent form, one where players threw rocks at each other. 
On an unrelated note, have you heard that Google search is pretty much useless these days, cluttered with copy-paste AI churn of questionable value? I feel like this somehow seems worth mentioning because there's actually no indication from legitimate academic sources that dodgeball originated from African games that involved beating each other with big rocks. There is, however, ample evidence that dodgeball-like games date back thousands of years to various cultures in South America, East Asia, North Africa, and that eventually school kids picked up on the fact that inflatable medicine balls are perfect for tossing at one another. They're the ideal combination of lightweight yet firm. So they fly fast and they leave a nasty welt, but they probably won't cause any lasting harm. The dodgeball unit of gym class quickly became a favorite of high school bullies who relished the opportunity to target the smaller or weaker kids with the full blessing of the school administration. Dodgeball wouldn't land anyone in the hospital, but a well-timed throw could break someone's glasses, or if they planned it well, leave someone doubled over and vomiting with the pain of genital trauma. And that makes Super Dodgeball one of the weirdest NES releases ever. Not because it's the school sports sequel to a groundbreaking life or death street combat game, mind you. No, the weird thing about Super Dodgeball is that an entire chain of executives and creators at Technos and a totally separate string of marketers and suits at Sony ImageSoft looked at this game topic and thought, yes, this is 100% what our video game loving audience wants. And really, who doesn't want to play a video game that reminds them of how they got the shit kicked out of them at school for being the kind of nerd who loves video games? Post-traumatic triggers, the most compelling form of marketing on earth. Okay, I'm overstating things a little bit here, but only a little bit. You have to keep in mind the fact that the video games in 1989 were a very different creature from video games in 2024. Literally everyone plays video games today, but 35 years ago, they were pretty much the domain of dorks and losers. I'm speaking from experience here. Tetris hadn't come along yet to cause your dad to steal the Game Boy you got for your birthday, and there was no Dr. Mario for your grandmother to play daily for 20 years. And most importantly, Sony hadn't marketed the PlayStation to young adults of all demographics, using the powers of capitalism to give everyone permission to dabble in gaming. The PlayStation was still a long way away. In fact, so far as I can tell, this was Sony's very first video game release under their own Steam. The company's music publishing arm had released a couple of Famicom games in Japan by this point, in collaboration with other companies, see Epic Sony Records and CBS Sony Group, almost all of which were tie-ins with musical acts on various Sony record labels, like Seki Matu, but Super Dodgeball came to us from Sony's own house electronics label, ImageSoft, which had been freshly minted to tackle the US market and made its debut with Super Dodgeball. I guess maybe there is something to Sony's reputation for catering to thick-necked bros after all, except that well, Super Dodgeball isn't actually just a game for thick-necked bros. It may have an odious theme, but damn if it isn't fun. For starters, it feels a lot more confident and polished than Renegade. Although the original Renegade had hit NES a little more than a year earlier, the two games feel like they belong to different generations of software entirely. I've mentioned many times over the course of this series just how much of a difference the NES's advanced memory management chips made to the quality of games for the console, and you can really see that dynamic in action here in the Kunio Kun series. Renegade, a 128 kilobyte UN ROM, looked and played a little, well, sketchily. It was fine as a game, but its graphics were rough and its action seemed unpolished. Super Dodgeball packs twice Renegade's memory on a 256 kilobyte MMC1 chip, and you can really see the difference. The characters are bigger, more amusingly comical, and they occupy more detailed backgrounds. The gameplay moves more smoothly and has a decidedly solid feel to it. Tossing, catching, and dodging the ball doesn't involve any guesswork at all. You can predict where the ball will travel and time your actions accordingly. Super Dodgeball features a ton of characters moving around the screen at any given moment, and not in a tech mobile, double dribble sort of way in which every character is just the same sprite duplicated. This is like hoops, but more so. Your team can contain a variety of different looking players, with physical appearances that denote their in-game attributes. You know, like in Nintendo's ice hockey. Not only do the beefy guys on the team throw hard but move slowly as one would expect, but they also have more stamina than their scrawnier peers. And here we see the logic in Kunio's move from inner-city brawling to intramural sports. 
the two ideas aren't that inherently different. Super Dodgeball retains the forced perspective of Renegade, where it results in an even play space, a rectangle with nearly squared corners and boundaries. The vanishing point perspective of games like tennis doesn't apply here, meaning that there's no fundamental advantage to sticking to the forecourt. No matter where you stand on the court, you have the same amount of room to maneuver for attacks and evasion. And attacks really does seem like the most applicable word here. Fittingly, for such a combative sport, your actions in Super Dodgeball are not so much serves or throws as they are assaults. You have a simple goal in each match. Knock the other team entirely out of action. Super Dodgeball does not use classic one-and-done rules for the game. Your team members can take a hit and still continue playing so long as they have some stamina. Though once they run out of stamina, they vanish from the field and float away as angels, suggesting that the school-sanctioned competition involves play to the death. Look, things really were different in the 80s. Each match allows you to field six team members to take on your rivals, who represent the finest volleyball talent from other countries. You field three players inside the court and three outside the bounds, assisting from the sidelines. Super Dodgeball is programmed to minimize the amount of thought you have to put into juggling active control over your athletes. If one of your guys has the ball, the D-pad controls them. If the bad guys have the ball, your dude closest to the ball becomes your active character. Match play only has one real rule. Your active team member can't touch the ground outside of the court boundaries while holding the ball. Beyond that, it's pretty much anything goes. This involves sending the ball outside of the court. For example, you can pass it to players on the sidelines so that they can launch an attack from behind. You can also take a running leap over the half-court line in order to smash a rival with an up-close attack, which is perfectly fine so long as you release the ball before you land on the wrong side of the court. Of course, the CPU can do all of these things too, and it definitely will if you play on anything besides easy difficulty. The computer really loves its super shots and power shots, which are special attacks that deliver amplified power but require you to make a running dash across the court to build up momentum. It can be difficult to aim these super attacks if you're human. If you're the computer, however, it's no problem. You can pull off a bunch of different advanced shots, which vary by team and player. And the idea of individualism is a newly added feature for the NES game. In the coin-op version, your characters had more varied body types, but they were just nameless guys chucking the ball. On NES, all six members of each team have unique names, visible stamina meters indicating their current durability, and distinct proficiency stats and skills. When characters take a ball to the face, a little number pops up to indicate the damage they've suffered. A visual gimmick we haven't actually seen on NES yet, and one which would be canonized by Final Fantasy IV a couple of years later. Yes, Kunio-kun may have ventured into sports here, but you can see Super Dodgeball laying the groundwork for the series' eventual move into the action RPG space. Now, it's probably worth mentioning that the standard tournament play mode only supports a single player. And then there's beanball mode, a free-for-all in which you and another player control a member of Team USA in a schoolyard while attempting to end the match as the last man standing. Super Dodgeball offers another first here, or it should have anyway. In Japan, Neketsu Koko Dodgeball Bu was the first Famicom release to offer four-player simultaneous play with the use of a newly released adapter. But wouldn't you know it, the NES's four-player options wouldn't surface for another year. So Technos dummied out the four-player feature for the US. Yeah, the one time an enormous localization delay would have worked in our favor, and wouldn't you know it, we got a relatively timely translation instead. As for what that translation entailed, well, obviously any suggestion that the protagonist was a Japanese high schooler is right out. The playable team is now Team USA, and Kunio-kun has taken on the frankly amazing new name of Sam Powers. This would not be his last alias in America, nor would this be the last Kunio-kun game for the NES, not to mention the last Sony game release. I suppose all of that goes without saying. Anyway, the game otherwise retains its international competition angle, despite the change in the home team, naturally culminating in a showdown against the USSR, a cliché rapidly nearing its sell-by date. And for players who could ace the tourney and avoid letting any of their school children die a brutal death in search of intramural glory, Super Dodgeball leaned into the action RPG format again by reprising the final battle from Zelda 2, a hidden team comprised of shadow versions of Team USA's players. 
I feel like Super Dodgeball shouldn't work. It's a sports game based on a fighting game being marketed to an audience of kids who had a high chance of being bruised from real-life dodgeball abuse. But wouldn't you know it, Technos did a great job here. I don't admittedly remember Super Dodgeball getting a lot of press back in the day, but once emulation took off a decade later, this game quickly exploded into one of the newly rediscovered sleepers of the NES library. And just a few years after that, Dodgeball suddenly became a minor cultural phenomenon, getting its own Hollywood movie, followed by professional leagues. I'm not saying that Super Dodgeball is responsible for all of that, necessarily, but there's no proof that it's not. See, emulation and game preservation are good. And what did Nintendo Power say? Well, like I said, Super Dodgeball didn't get a lot of press back in the day. The magazine gave it a tiny little preview in the March-April 89 issue, and then a half-page video shorts preview in the May-June issue. After that, the only mention was the occasional tip and a single showing near the bottom of the Nintendo Power Top 30 list. Next time on NES Works, a retrospective that's alright by me, if it's alright by you.